good morning all i'm sakit karnik the speaker for this session where we are going to learn developing solutions that use cosmos db programmability features precisely the focus is going to be on understanding uh, how the cosmos db account is created how the databases can be created which are based on no sql concept uh, how the containers can be created into those databases and then adding the sample data then we'll see how we create and use the stored procedures how do we create and use triggers where again we are going to see two types of triggers pre trigger and post trigger and then we'll see how to create and use user defined functions a feature said that usually we have already been working with in various rdbms systems but uh, when it comes to nosql not all of the nosql uh, implementations have all these features there are some which provides these features and cosmos db is one of them again if you are aware of the cosmos db uh, uh, product you might be aware of that it supports multiple wire protocols uh, that can be used to communicate with uh, databases created using different platforms different technologies like cosmos db supports sql db formerly which used to be called as document db the product from microsoft then it supports azure tables it also supports mongodb it supports cassandra it supports gremlin and then the newest entry in that list is etdc so six different var protocols being supported as of now by cosmos db and uh, that's where again we have to see the features that we are going to learn possibly they are supported in some of these uh, product lines and not all the others so here uh, our focus is going to be on the cosmos db core sql api uh, as i said which uh, formerly used to be called as document db so let me talk about myself first of all uh, i'm having 20 plus years of experience uh, mostly on microsoft technologies i started as a vb5.0 developer moved on to vb6.0 and then since early 2000 i'm working with uh, .net framework when microsoft released the very first beta of uh, .net framework so i have been always an early adopter and hence uh, have worked on most of the beta versions uh, of .net framework that microsoft has released till date including .net core platform as well uh my current strength uh, basically is more into uh, microsoft cloud platform that is uh, azure so i do conduct trainings for azure development uh, features and then azure infra features as well so uh, certification wise i am into azure 900 then azure 10304 then azure 20304 and even uh 300 series also i am into so that's my introduction uh, talking about optimistic info systems we started in november 2011 mostly uh, focusing on microsoft technologies uh and later on we diverged into uh catering the uh, training and consulting services for what are the technologies that are required in the it industries so broad umbrella of the technologies that we are serving for and uh, not only the technological trainings we do conduct some non technological trainings also like uh, scrum agile uh, pmp and uh, even uh, soft skills as well so that's about optimistic info systems and now let's start with the session so i hope the agenda is pretty clear shivaji you can unmute yourself and you can get interacting with me oh yeah hi hi yes sakit yeah so have you worked on cosmos db uh, before this 
No, no, I'm very new for this actually. I'm not. Uh, I'm working as an Oracle and Postgres DBA, not a Cosmos DBA. Okay, so mostly the uh, experience that you have is uh, more on uh, the Oracle RDBMS Postgres. systems, right? Yes, right. Yeah. So uh, let's start with the very uh, basic uh, uh, stuff uh, over here. Uh, like okay. the Cosmos DB is a NoSQL platform. So we need okay. to understand what is NoSQL and uh, where uh, that comes into picture, what kind of applications uh, we can uh, think of while implementing Cosmos DB, right? Yes, sure, sure. Or do you have any idea on NoSQL, what NoSQL uh, is? Uh, no, no, I don't have any idea because we never, never came across this kind of, you know, in the organization also. So, okay, so by the fun. term, by the term, can you uh, guess what NoSQL possibly could be? Uh, by the name defines that NoSQL means there is no SQL, I think so, but I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, obvious, obvious response. Uh, the thing is NoSQL has uh, got a full name to it that stands for not only SQL, where okay. SQL actually refers to the relations in RDBMS, not the awesome. SQL query language. The okay. language is uh, not having anything to do over here. Okay. Oh, is it? So okay. when we talk about RDBMS, the primary uh, motive over there is to create different entities, what we okay. call as relations, and uh, we establish the relations between the different entities. Am I right? Yeah, right. Correct. Most of the data has to be connected to each other some way or the other using some master detail relationship, right? We have right. primary keys foreign keys and the data is uh, entirely distributed like that. And we achieve that design after going through a process called as normalization. Am I correct? Okay. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm not much, uh, you know, aware, aware of this uh, developing side like PLSQL and SQL, um, you know. I'm, yeah, that's okay. Structure, structure of the database you must be aware of, right? Yeah, I'm aware of the structure of the database. Yeah, so that's where the normalization process comes in and uh, you design your tables and you uh, define the columns for those tables and uh, the keys and all that you define over there. Yes, yes right. Yes, right. Okay. Now, uh, what kind of data we can uh, actually hold in uh, RDBMS? Uh, Say when it comes to the line of business applications, we have defined structure, we have defined data types, we have. Uh, limited number of columns in most of the cases, though that number of columns might be uh, uh, very much on larger side at times, but uh, still it is defined when it comes to the line of business application, right? Yes, right. And that's where the RDBMS probably suits more. And uh, to avoid the duplication of the data and all that, we go through the process called as normalization. And now yes. because the data is going to be distributed across multiple tables, that's where the relations come in, which allow us to combine that data as and when required and project it in the way how a single table uh, data model is going to look like. That's where probably we use joins and subqueries and uh, the other features which are probably based on relations only. Am I right? Okay, yes, right. Okay, now understand the situation where uh, the kind of application that we are not, uh, we, are, we are writing is not typically a line of business application or maybe a part of the line of business application where the kind of data uh, that is getting uh, uh, received on the server side uh, doesn't have any specific predefined structure. So for example, if I talk about any job portal, apart from your profile details that you feed into some kind of uh, online form, you have to attach your profile as well. Right? right now that yes. profile can be a word document that profile can be pdf document that profile can be uh, some uh, video profile depending on what kind of job you are looking for right, right. so if, uh, suppose if you are looking for some non technical job maybe some uh, sort of uh, acting uh, uh, opportunity is there where you want to apply and that's where you need your portfolio to be shared in the form of either photographs or a typical video where some kind of audition rec uh, recording has been put and that you want to upload, right? So the kind of profiles which will be uploaded, uh, the structure of that profile, the kind of data that is uh, available in that profile is not predefined. It can be anything, 
Okay. Yeah, basically, I want to know is this Cosmos DB is uh, used for most of the which kind of industries like uh, like yeah. Welcome to that. So welcome to that also. So okay. understand this situation where we have variety of information coming in for uh, the similar sort of uh, requirement. Right. I am looking for a profile. That profile can be document. That profile can be. Uh, image that profile can be video that profile can be a zip file also containing multiple things which may include documents images and videos all together right so how do i handle this when it comes to the database uh sorry can you please come again uh, exactly yeah so what i'm saying is when it comes to the profile that profile can be a single document maybe word or pdf that okay. profile can be an image that profile okay. can be a video that profile okay. can be a collection of all these things in a zip file. Okay. I want that to be stored into the database. How do I support that from the database end? Uh, actually, basically, I think uh, I we know in the Oracle or Postgres, we, we, there is no option to call the store this kind of uh, documents like a PDF mm -hmm. or whatever it is. So mm -hmm. basically, all the data will be stored in the in the block level blocks. I think in the, I think you might be aware of this. You know, in the blocks, uh, is Oracle is uh, completely in the structure like a block block storage. So every block will be the KB. So that kind of info, you know, it will be store all the transaction. What are the transaction? What are the archive logs coming? What are the yes. logs coming? All the generation, all uh, you know, generated logs will be stored in the database in the storage level at the block. You know, in the block in the form of block actually. So. Okay. We are right, but I'm not aware how. Yeah, that is that is pretty much at the uh, storage level we are talking about. The block is uh, very much the correct thing for most of the RDBMS systems. But mm -hmm. then uh, most of the RDBMS systems come up with a uh, data type called as blob, binary large objects, right? I yes. believe Oracle mm -hmm. also supports that. Right, but correct. The limitation with that is, first of all, you can have only one blob per table. Right, one one field of blob type per table. More mm -hmm. than one blobs you cannot have. What if my application's requirement is to store more than one blobs? Okay. That is that is where I, I feel the limitation comes in. The second thing is whenever we use blobs, as per mm -hmm. any RDBMS product, if you use say PostgreSQL or Oracle or SQL mm -hmm. Server or MySQL, whichever mm -hmm. one we use, the documentation itself says that as far as it is possible, don't use blobs. The reason okay. behind that is, uh, if you use blobs, it has got direct impact on your query performances as well, right? Because blobs are pretty large in size, maybe 4 GB, 8 GB in size at times, and that makes your queries very heavy, which means the retrieval of the data is going to be a little uh, slower, okay. right? So that is another limitation. Uh, thirdly, uh, the thing is, whenever I'm looking for querying the data, definitely I want to include the documents also what I'm storing, the files also what I'm storing as the part of that record. And I cannot just avoid querying that particular field, right? So definitely the query performance is going to be important for me. And yes. at the same time, I want... Uh, in some cases, this blob field also to be the part of the indexes. That is also where I have a limitation, right? Blobs cannot have indexes built on the top of them because they contain the raw data, okay? Mm. So these are okay. some of the limitations. And uh, another requirement where I may need to think beyond the uh, RDBMS system is like where the kind of data that I'm receiving from the client is not structured. Sometimes I'm getting two fields, sometimes I'm getting 20 fields, sometimes I'm getting just five fields, right? Uh, okay. A random structure of the data is coming and that is somehow uh, related to uh, one type of entity, but I don't have the availability of most of the uh, columns or the data for most of the columns uh, that I have defined into the table. Though this can be handled with the help of null values going into those columns where the data is not present, but see, if you have too many nulls into your uh, table, the indexing is also not going to work properly. And once again, it will uh, directly uh, have an impact on the performance of your queries, right? Because if indexes are not properly built, 
if they have right. a lot of null values ultimately right. that has got direct impact on your query performance so right have, then we need to tune the query for this yes yes so one of the solution possibly over here could be uh, uh, going back to that requirement where i want to store the blob types uh, mm -hmm. usually what developers used to do earlier is like create the table with regular columns which store the data that can be represented as rows and columns and with additional field that probably contains the reference or the path of the file which is uh, being uploaded so basically though that file or those files can be uploaded to some server's file system and the url of that particular location can be stored as an additional field as a part of the table in that way we will not be making use of blobs and we will be able to use as many files being stored on the server uh, with the help of the database as we want. Because within database, we'll, we are not storing the file itself, we are storing only the path of the file. Right? So the limitation can be overcome. But once again, when it comes to the null values and all, we still have a, a challenge. And also, in this case, when we are storing the path of the files, uh, when we query the database, we just query the table probably we just get the path of the files now that is one of the server round trip which will happen i mean the request comes from client goes to the server the query gets executed and response goes back to the client this is called as round trip right. now when i'm uh, looking to read the files associated with the retrieved records for each of the file once again i need to make a round trip to the server by reading the url of the file from the database table results and then uh, hit that particular file system uh, URL and get that particular file. So suppose one record has got four files and I have thousand such records retrieved. 4,000 more round trips will be required to read the contents of those files. So right. it has to scan entire uh, all the details. Huh? Exactly, right? exactly. So this is definitely going to be an impact on overall uh, response time. Now, if I'm looking to query Probably what I want is one shot uh, querying to happen where I retrieve all the details what I'm looking for and uh, just in memory processing I do directly on the client side and uh, I don't go for any server round trip uh, in such cases, right? Especially if the data is used, this is going to be important for me, right? Correct. So this is where basically we have the concept of NoSQL database. How it all started is like if you see the social networking uh, platforms, say if you talk about Facebook, if you talk about Twitter, if mm -hmm. you talk about LinkedIn, yes. the kind of data which gets uh, shared, which gets uploaded on these platforms is not structured, right? Anybody can put anything. They can yes, put please. one single line statement, they can have one paragraph, they can have uh, hundreds of pages of information. They can upload documents, they can upload images, they can upload audio, video files, they can upload yes. virtually anything. Am I right? Sometimes those are just website links or something. How this worried information can be handled and stored into the database, and that is also without any delay because the pace at which this information gets generated across the world is too high. If we think that, OK, we will still use RDBMS system, uh, probably we will have some sort of uh, transformation logic which reads the incoming request and transforms that raw information into some structured information and gets stored in the database. This logic is going to take some time to execute, right? Um, that's right. And most of the web servers, you would agree that will have some sort of uh, limitations and those limitations most likely will cause bottlenecks and uh, service not available errors uh, probably will be uh, faced by most of the clients in that case so what we want is if we are looking for an internet scale application uh, the data when it is uh, received from the client as the part of the request should get processed as soon as possible and get stored as soon as possible so without applying any transformation without applying any uh, specific logic just by doing some basic input validation. We want the storage to happen almost immediately. So this is where once again, NoSQL storage comes in, which says that I'll not look for the structure, I'll uh, store the data uh, the way how it is coming, right? Okay. Yeah, got it. In, most likely in the raw format, or maybe some specific format might be there in some cases like 
आई मे हैव एक्समेल डॉक्यूमेंट कमिंग एन आई मे हैव जेसन डॉक्यूमेंट कमिंग एन आई मे हैव बाइनरी जेसन डॉक्यूमेंट कमिंग एन आई मे हैव की वैल्यू पेयर कमिंग एन आई मे हैव सम कॉलमर स्ट्रक्चर कमिंग एन और आई मे हैव द ऑब्जेक्ट ग्राफ कमिंग एन सो आई वॉन्ट दैट डेटा टू बी टेकन इन टू कंसिडरेशन विदाउट अप्लाइंग एनी ट्रांसफॉर्मेशन जस्ट बाई डूइंग सम बेसिक इनपुट वैलिडेशन get this information stored as is so yeah. the sql database makes sense so basically cosmos db completely you know supports uh, more i mean i mean not only uh, you know more over i mean uh, in the 100% it will uh, supports no sql only right but what about yes. the other so i would put it the other way around cosmos db is a product from microsoft which supports no sql storage okay okay not the rdbms uh, type of storage now why it is called as cosmos db we have to understand the term cosmo cosmo uh, comes into picture when we talk about the mixed cultures and all right like okay. if i say pune is a cosmopolitan city what does that mean we don't okay. have one specific type of community staying over here uh, uh we have uh, people from different communities from different cultural backgrounds from different places of the india uh, people are coming together staying working together and uh doing uh, their routine jobs right so that's why we call the term as cosmopolitan city right so yes. like that when it comes to no sql as i said there are different storage formats in which the data can be put as i said it could be json it could be binary json it could be xml it could be key value it could be object graph it could be something else as well right now yes. here cosmos db is a product from microsoft which has been built in such a way that it supports different formats with the help of different wire protocols now when i say different wire protocols what does that mean it actually has uh, created different apis with the help of which we can have the different types of data stored into it as per the requirement of the application if my application wants json i will use core sql api if i want binary json i would use mongodb api if i am looking for object graphs probably i will go for gremlin if i am looking for key value pairs i will go for azure tables and so on right so different types of storages can happen over here and that's where they have built the compatibility also with other no sql products uh, which are uh, very much uh, popular in the market so for example the most popular product uh, for no sql storage is mongodb today the second in line is cassandra the third in line is gremlin right so all those products they have already taken into consideration and have built their apis to support the storage into the cosmos db service behind scenes and not only storage the retrieval also supported by those respective apis right and where interoperability if i talk about they have created that interoperability also between sql and gremlin service uh the other services are not yet interoperable but very soon most likely microsoft will introduce the interoperability between the other products also but the biggest advantage is suppose if i'm already having an application that uses mongodb into the backend i want that to be migrated to the cloud scale and that's where i'm looking to migrate my mongodb uh, mongodb database on uh, azure platform uh mongodb as a standalone service i don't have on azure for that uh, the one of the way is i need to create a virtual machine on azure platform and within that virtual machine i need to get mongodb server installed and then i migrate my on premises mongodb database to the azure hosted virtual machine so there is no big difference as such between the on premises hosting and the cloud hosting in that case besides uh, just one difference that will be applicable that my server machine is going to be more and more scalable so the machine itself will be cloud scale but when it comes to the mongodb service or mongodb database the scalability will be limited to what mongodb product has provided me i will not have much into my hands in that case but okay. my point and right. again the installation the setup the configuration everything has to be taken care of by me because i would be using the infrastructure as a service offering from azure in that case as i'm working with a vm if i'm looking for a cloud scale microsoft managed or in simple terms managed service for mongodb i have to get into cosmos db where cosmos db already has got mongodb api built into it and 
I just need to change my connection parameters. Uh, I mean, connection strings and all those details at my client application. My application need not be changed at all, apart from the connection string update. Does that make sense or not? Yeah, that doesn't make sense. Here, the yes. setup, the installation, the configuration, everything is going to be taken care of by Microsoft uh, okay. at the product level. You just need to provide the configuration, which is application specific uh, in your case. Right. Like uh, so, what, what kind of, you know, it's uh, includes like what storage and everything, right? Yes, I mean, everything, everything, everything will be taken care of by the Cosmos DB service in the mm -hmm. backend, right? You awesome. just need to go and put some uh, developer specific options, the application specific options uh, into uh, that uh, MongoDB deployment on Cosmos DB uh, mm -hmm. as per your application's name. So, that saves a lot of time, that saves lots of uh, uh, efforts from our side, and uh, that that actually makes it ready to use kind of solution, right? I just need to use the migration scripts. There are lots of migration tools also available, which uh, probably can be used to automate the migration from the on-premises database, which may already have lots of information into it, to the Cosmos DB hosted MongoDB instance. Right, so okay. that's where again the Cosmos DB becomes one-stop solution for whatever the kind of NoSQL uh, storage you are looking for, or NoSQL solution you are looking for, and mm -hmm. the migration is pretty smooth. Right, you don't need to change your applications at all. Right, so whether so, you are looking for MongoDB to be migrated, Cassandra, Kremlin, or uh, maybe the table storage to be migrated, you already have your services built into Cosmos DB. Right? Okay. Yeah, so basically, uh, something I want to ask you, like, uh, it's completely, it's cloud, um, I mean, Cosmos DB supports clouds, right? It is completely in the cloud, yes, right? It's a, it's a service based on, uh, com completely on Azure cloud itself. Okay, that's good. Okay, fine. So by default, you get the uh, features of cloud, along mm -hmm. with the platform as a service offering. So completely managed by Azure. You don't need to do anything regarding the storage. You don't need to do anything regarding the installation. You don't need to uh, do anything regarding the availability and all clustering and mirroring and all those features. Probably you just need to go and put the configuration as per the need. And everything will be set up automatically by uh, the platform. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, just uh, so being a Cosmos DBA, what kind of activities we can perform? I mean, you know, everything will be taken care of, then what kind of activities will be there? Uh, see, once again, uh, when it comes to the user management, uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to the uh, setup of, you know, high availability, like mm -hmm. if you are looking for uh, the disaster recovery scenarios, backups mm -hmm. and restores, those common DBA activities will still be applicable. Uh, okay, I got it. So we we will get any kind of like after the session. What kind of you know how can we refer go through all those? Things? Are you providing any kind of documents or something like uh, that? Yeah. So uh, being a, a cloud service, basically mm -hmm. this keeps on changing a lot uh, very rapidly. So mm -hmm. usually I don't uh, prefer uh, anyone to refer any uh, pre-created document. The mm -hmm. best uh, resource for this is uh, docs.microsoft.com for Cosmos DB. Well, okay. you can get the up to date, most up to date information um, mm -hmm. straight away uh, regarding the Cosmos DB. Right? Because okay. every three weeks it is changing, uh, mm -hmm. coming up with the new features continuously. Uh, you can understand most of the products now have adopted the agile uh, methodology, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, when we with agile, we have got three week sprints and all that. So right. that's where we see uh, the updates pretty rapidly. and. Because of that, the stored documentation probably will be stale at times. It's better to refer to the uh, official documentation from Microsoft. Okay. okay. So I'll share the link for that where you can find all the information towards okay. the end of the session. Sure. Okay. So let's see how do we proceed with this Cosmos DB deployment and setup and all that. It sure. is not at all like we are going to install the Cosmos DB service somewhere or something. It is mm -hmm. just about that I want to subscribe to the Cosmos DB service. I want mm -hmm. to procure an instance of Cosmos DB for me, just like mm -hmm. how do we create named instances for the RDBMS systems. Mm -hmm. I believe something similar is there in PostgreSQL and Oracle also, where we have Oracle installed already on one of the machine, 
but I am looking for an independent instance of the Oracle to be accessible for some other application requirement. Instead of installing Oracle right from the scratch, I just create a named instance of it. Right? Like it's kind of Exadata. Yes, exactly. So yes. here on the cloud platform as a service offering, you have something similar where Cosmos DB service is already deployed by mm -hmm. Microsoft on their Azure platform. Okay. We just need to procure the instance, which will be totally private to us. And we yes. will have 100% control of what mm -hmm. that instance will do, to whom it will be accessible, and okay. who can do what. Right. Oh, so yeah. let's go ahead. For that, what you need is Microsoft account, which could be Outlook.com account, which could be Hotmail.com account, Live.com account. Or if you are working with Microsoft, it could be Microsoft.com account also. Right. And that account must have the Azure subscription activated into it. OK, mm -hmm. so that subscription can be a purchase subscription. That subscription can be some offer based subscription. That subscription can be a trial subscription also. Okay. You can create a free trial as well. If you uh, look for Azure free trial on Google, by default, it will guide you through the process. Sure. For that, you just need the Microsoft account. So I already have one such uh, account. Okay. Just got active subscription into it. I just mm -hmm. go to portal.azure.com. <coughs> I was already logged into this uh, browser instance. It directly okay. takes me to the actual portal. If I'm not logged in, first of all, it will ask me for the credentials. So okay. it is just like the ID password you provide and log in, and then you get to this dashboard. For getting to this dashboard, you don't need the active subscription. Subscription can be added afterwards also. The point is, if you don't have active subscription and try to create a new resource, it will mm -hmm. say you don't have any active subscription. Please create one. Here itself, you get a link. And once you mm -hmm. click that, it guides you through how to get the new subscription activated, which could be free trial, which can be pay-as-you-go subscription. Mm -hmm. Pay-as-you-go means you will be uh, presented with a bill Mm -hmm. on monthly basis based on whatever services you have deployed and whatever usage has happened. So you'll be okay. presented with the bill which you have to pay. Okay. And for that, you need to link the credit card. Got it. OK, so here what I'm looking for is a Cosmos DB account to be created. For that, first of all, I'll go to resource groups. And I'll click on add. Resource group is just like a virtual container that mm -hmm. will hold all of the resources that you deploy for a specific project or a, a specific team. Now, uh, this uh, deployment which I'm going to do is specific to this particular session. After this session, it will not be useful for me. I would like to delete all the deployments which I would be doing. So what okay. I do is I create a dedicated resource group for this session. Whatever I deploy, I deploy in this resource group. And later on, instead of deploying each resource one by one, I just delete the resource group and it will automatically delete all the resources deployed. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so here, let's say I give the name to this resource group as demo RG. Mm -hmm. And I, then I need to select the region which decides where mm -hmm. my data will reside. So here I select Asia Pacific Southeast Asia, which is a data center in uh, Singapore location. And it's kind so, of a region, right? Or uh, like yeah. it's kind of a region. Exactly. So where my data will reside. Now, okay. while creating the uh, applications, the actual applications, actual resources that you deploy, it will all depend on a uh, couple of things. Where mm -hmm. your audience is, first of all. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to select a region near to your audience. Mm -hmm. Say, for example, if you're looking for uh, people who are uh, in America, right, mm -hmm. uh, East America. So probably you will select the region East America, East US, okay. right? Yeah. Uh, just to avoid the network latency and all, that is a simple thing. The second okay. consideration you have to take into account is if that application or that resource is going to be used for some government uh, uh, requirement, many governments have their own restrictions saying that, okay, the data should not go beyond this region. So oh, yes, sir. that case, even if your audience is say in India, but mm -hmm. that application is a US government applica uh, application. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to select a data center in US only. Yes. Right? Right. Okay. Even if there is a latency in the network uh, and all, you have to uh, actually go with that. So these yeah. couple of things are based on which you select your region. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for me, I'm selecting Southeast Asia, which is Singapore. 
I say next. Ah, it's just like attaching some metadata to the deployment that you are doing. Right now we are deploying a resource group. So if I want to attach some metadata which is specific to uh, for what requirement I am creating this resource group and all, I might want some key value pairs to be added as the metadata. Later okay. on, we have too many resource groups. This metadata is something which will help us to understand which mm -hmm. resource group is for what reason. Right. So okay. for now, I'm just ignoring this. I click on next and then click on create. Resource group would be created almost immediately because actually it's not a service that we have deployed. It's just a container. So here I can see demo RG added. I can also say go to resource group from here to get into it or I can mm -hmm. click this resource group to get into it. Anyways, mm -hmm. it will be empty for now. So I don't do that. I just close all the blades created over here and I click on create a resource. And here, what I'm looking for ultimately is a Cosmos DB instance, right? right. Now, Cosmos DB is a database service. So mm -hmm. in the categories under my uh, Azure Marketplace, I'll search, search for databases, which mm -hmm. is here. I click on that. Mm -hmm. And in that, I can see Azure Cosmos DB is there. Yes, right. So I select this Azure Cosmos DB. So resource in the sense, it's a kind of container, right? It's a container in the container. We are creating new database, right? Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Resource group is container for any cloud-based service that you would be deploying. It may yeah, have right. virtual machines also created into it. So it's mean like container in the sense, like for example, uh, if I'm taking example, like if there is a ship and ship is holding multiple containers, right? Yes, a ship absolutely. is inside something kind of container, right? Absolutely. And absolutely. Uh, to be precise, to make it simple, you can compare this with a folder containing different kind of files and other folders. Yeah, okay, got it. Okay. And yeah. where you can do the permission management also, like who can access this container, who cannot access, and yes, right. uh, all that permission management also can be done. Yeah, got it. Okay, so here now I need to select my subscription in which the deployment has to happen. My user account may have more than one subscriptions also into it, but now it shows me that I have only one subscription. I just select that. This is important because uh, while working in organization, you may be associated with more than one projects as well. And beside mm -hmm. that, you may have some of your personal subscriptions as well, right? So yes, you have right. to carefully select which subscription you want the deployment into. If it mm -hmm. is a project requirement you are fulfilling, it should be the project subscription. And again, mm -hmm. specific project subscription you have to select. And then if it is some personal work that you are doing for learning purposes, you have to select the personal subscription carefully. Okay. Then comes the resource group. Here, by default, I'll get the list of all the resource groups which have been created in this subscription. Correct. And I need to select the right resource group where I want the deployment to happen. Yes. So I more. select demo RG. If I have not created a resource group already before coming over here, I have the option to create one from mm -hmm. create new. Here itself, it asks me for the resource group name. Okay. okay, and that resource group will be used. Then comes the account name, which has to be globally unique account name because uh, your instance is going to be named with this name and which will be created as a subdomain of a pre existing domain. Hence, this needs oh. to be globally unique. Account name in the sense like uh, it's a DB name? Uh, not DB name, it's the service name. Service name like okay, one DB can have multiple instances. So you are giving an instance yeah. one instance to something like that. Exactly, exactly. So oh. in this case, the instance will have the DBs created into it. Yes, right, correct. Okay, so I'll name this as OI demo cosmos DB SRV for service. Okay. Whether it's unique or not globally, by default, I get the feedback here with this green tick. Green tick mm -hmm. means it's available. It's unique okay. across globe. If okay. it is not available, I will get the red uh, colored button over here with exclamation mark onto it. Okay. Like if I name this as demo, most likely this name will not be available. Okay. Right. So, okay, they have changed the UI. Instead of giving red button with uh, exclamation mark, here they are giving the uh, validation error with uh, cross coming over here with name is not available. Okay. 
so you mean i mean sorry sorry you mean no, name is not available in the sense we cannot uh, prefer this kind of names or any specific uh, yeah that specific name. name has been already taken by someone else for their service okay okay got it yeah. as i said this name is created as a subdomain in the pre existing domain okay, now okay. if it is a internet domain definitely it has to be unique right okay right correct yes right okay then comes okay. the selection for api as i said there are 5 to 6 uh, wire protocols which are being supported by uh, azure cosmos db mm -hmm. uh, five i can see the list will vary based on which region we have selected mm -hmm. right in some region you may have uh, etdc also included in uh, mm -hmm. the current region what is selected over here uh, the etdc is not available hence it is not showing so let me select the region first of all to southeast asia uh, select southeast asia and let's see Mm -hmm. here also i have the same five uh, uh, wire protocol supported so core sql that is uh, something which named uh, which was named as document db in the past mm -hmm. which now has been renamed to core sql and this represents your json document storage for mac okay. then you have azure cosmos db for mongo db api this represents mongo db deployment From where your yes. data is stored in binary json format then okay. you have cassandra so cassandra is a no sql product which has mm -hmm. been imported over here and then you have gremlin which stores object graphs and then okay. you have azure table which stores uh, key value pairs okay. right so now i'm going to select core sql which is microsoft's own product the okay. other microsoft's own product is azure table gremlin okay. cassandra etdc and uh, mongo db these are all third party products which they have just supported mm -hmm. by creating the wire protocols here so okay. here i select core sql Remember, once you select this, this cannot be changed. Okay. You have to create a new Cosmos DB account for a different wire protocol. The second okay. thing is, once you select Core SQL, all mm -hmm. of your deployment is going to be based on uh, Core SQL uh, format only. That is JSON. If you select MongoDB, it has to be binary JSON always. If it is selected as uh, Gremlin, it has to be object graph always. Right. Okay, so, but it is configuration will be chosen by customer. I mean, client or we have to decide client, that. Client, client uh, most likely will choose if they are not aware of which one to be uh, chosen. You can right. actually suggest from your side what will be the best after okay. analyzing their applications requirement. Okay, fine. Right. Yeah, got it. So, in ninety percent cases, it is chosen by the customer because they know their data the best. Yes, right. Correct. Okay, but in some cases where uh, if you are working for some kind of startup or may not be startup, but uh, they are uh, moving on to the NoSQL product uh, mm -hmm. very recently and they don't have any idea of what is NoSQL and how it works, then mm -hmm. that is the ten percent chance where we need to suggest. Okay. The notebooks uh, basically is a preview feature. That means it's not yet launched uh, for mm -hmm. the production. It is uh, more of a beta version and. Mm -hmm. this notebooks is precisely for the big data requirements mm -hmm. if you are having plans to use the data collected in cosmos db deployment uh, for big data analytics and all then you have to make this selected as on otherwise okay. just keep it off so for now i'm just keeping it off location we already set then there is a feature that azure offers named as apply pre tier discount so what they do is for azure subscription they provide you one cosmos db account which can be deployed without any charges being paid mm -hmm. okay. that is what free tier discount is for production uh, deployments most likely we are not going to use this but for development requirements we can uh, go for it but in in one subscription i can have the free tier discount applied only for one cosmos db deployment mm -hmm. and what we get in free there is 400 request units per second and 5 gb of the entire storage overall <coughs> okay if i go beyond this suppose my number of request uh, units that are coming per second are say 600 i will not be paying for first 400 request units per second i will mm -hmm. be required to pay only for the additional 200 request units per seconds okay So and similarly for dollars per month oh uh, yeah so depends on which currency uh, uh, your subscription has been created for 
that okay. could be dollars per month it could be uh, inr per month whatever it is so they will charge as per the data storage or, or some any yeah. other factor like in case of cosmos db the storage uh -huh. is one of the parameter the uh -huh. number of iops is another parameter okay iops means in input output how many queries you are running and uh -huh. also the bandwidth that is going to be used okay so, uh, bandwidth also includes how much cpu uh, usage was there how much mm -hmm. ram usage was there when mm -hmm. you combine all these parameters together that becomes request unit okay then 400 request unit doesn't mean 400 requests request unit means combination of cpu combination of ram plus uh, network bandwidth uh, plus uh, the storage all together okay right. so how to calculate this are you you can actually search for uh, that on google and they will give you that total uh, calculation function so one request unit may contain thousands of requests actually and this is really huge and 5 gb storage what that mean is if my data goes beyond 5 gb let's say 7 gb of data i'm storing mm -hmm. so i'll be paying only for two additional gbs of data first 5 gb is free for me if okay. three tier discount is applied mm -hmm. If the discount is not applied in that case, I'll be paying for even a single byte. Yes, right. is it clear? Correct. And mostly for production, we would be happy to pay because yes, but definitely. we will be having our business data and business is making money. That's why we are having the application. Correct. So nothing wrong in paying. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if it is a startup company for which the application has been built, um, mm -hmm. For their production requirement, also you can go for uh, a free tier discount. Until mm -hmm. and unless their request per unit doesn't go uh, beyond 400 request units per second, why, why should they pay? Correct, right. Similarly, if their data is well under 5 GB, why should they pay? <coughs> yes. And there will be no difference in terms of performance, uh, whether you have applied free tier discount or not. Okay, it doesn't matter. Yes. Then okay. comes account type, whether you are uh, deploying the service okay. for production requirement or development requirement. So mm -hmm. for now, I can keep non-production. Mm -hmm. Then comes geo redundancy. Geo redundancy would be required if I go for production. So like if I select production here, it mm -hmm. by default gets in it. Right? right. And this but is for disaster recovery. It's kind of I will, have, I will have my data copied in all the data centers in that particular region. Okay. All the uh, all the data centers in that particular region will have three mm -hmm. copies of my data. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it may be three available domains will be there, like a uh, fault yes. domain. I mean, right. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, fault domain comes into picture when it comes to availability zones. Right. Yes. Right. And uh, mm -hmm. this geo redundancy is beyond the availability zones now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Availability zone means what? Uh, you have one master data center and then you have fault domains. Fault domains, correct. Like it's a data right. guard, like within the right. same within the same physical location, geographical location, you have other two data centers. Correct, right. They will all have the copies. Yes, right. right. So if yeah. one of the data center fails for some reason, in mm -hmm. that case, there is another data center which becomes primary and serves the requirements. Mm -hmm. Right. So that is availability zone. Your redundancy is like you have data center beyond that geographical location. Okay, I mean beyond right. that uh, region. Right. So, like we selected Southeast Asia, I said it is Singapore location, but mm -hmm. in that region, Malaysian data center also comes. Yes, right. Okay. Now that is geographically located at a distant place, right? At least two hundred kilometer distance is required for okay. two two regions. Uh, in mm -hmm. fact, two zones. Okay. okay. So that is what geo redundancy will bring in. So mm -hmm. more reliability when uh, it comes to geo redundancy. Okay, got it. And then you have multi-region rights. You can probably guess what this could be. Yeah, multi-region. My data stored at multiple regions. I mean, uh, multiple data centers in that particular region. I should have the capability of writing the data to those multiple regions or multiple mm -hmm. data centers as well. In some cases where my application is of a kind where more writes are happening than reads. Mm -hmm. I'm doing more of data collection, like in case of some IoT-based application, Internet mm -hmm. of Things. I okay. may have 
more and more writes coming in than reads. So in mm -hmm. that case, I may need this. So we have got a choice over here whether mm -hmm. we want to use it or not. The point so is when you when we are enabling GeoRedden and see how mm -hmm. many data centers are storing your data multiplied by uh, the deployment uh, charges uh, will be charged to you. So suppose your charge is uh, five dollar per month for the basic uh -huh. deployment. In mm -hmm. that case, if you have enabled geo redundancy and there are three data centers in that region, mm -hmm. you will be charged thrice. Five dollar multiplied by three, that is fifteen dollars. So similarly, Correct. that is the case with availability zone. Suppose your zone contains three data centers, two mm -hmm. domain and one main, so it will be charged mm -hmm. multiplied by three. Okay. And then if you have geo redundancy, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, fifteen multiplied by three forty five will be charged to you. Okay. And similarly, if you then enable multi-region writes for writability, also you will be change, uh, the, you will be getting charged uh, mm -hmm. multiplied by three only, right? Okay. So that is how the charges will be decided. So for now, we will keep all of them decimal. Mm -hmm. Any questions before we move forward? Yeah, nothing. As of now, but uh, for after creation of digital base, is there a, like we can we uh, connect using the Linux operating system to particular okay. database? You can. So that that's the next thing. When okay. we go to next networking, here you decide who can connect, who cannot. Okay. Yeah. All networks. We have all networks. That means unrestricted access. Anyone can uh, communicate uh, who has got the public IP of your deployment, mm -hmm. right? With that IP address, anyone can connect. Mm -hmm. Public endpoint selected networks means here I need to whitelist the networks who can connect, who cannot. Okay. Okay, so virtual networks mm -hmm. I can configure. Beside mm -hmm. that, I can uh, configure my own IP address also. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter whether my machine is Windows or Linux. Okay. I will be able to connect. Mm -hmm. When I say private endpoint in that case, I I basically whitelist specific IPs only. Mm -hmm. Instead of net, instead of whole network. I okay. whitelist individual IPs who can connect, who cannot. It's okay. a very thin difference between these two. Here mm -hmm. I can configure IPs along with complete virtual networks. Here mm -hmm. I can whitelist only IPs, not the complete networks. Okay. Okay. For now, I'll see all networks selected mm -hmm. as we don't have any VNet deployed. Mm -hmm. So next, and here now, the next tab is about encryption. How the encryption will be managed. Mm -hmm. uh, by default, all the data that you store in Cosmos DB is mm -hmm. uh, stored in encrypted format, whichever API you use. Whether okay. you use SQL, you use MongoDB, you use Cassandra, Gremlin, ETDC, or Azure tables, your data is going to be stored in encrypted form. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so how that encryption would take place, whether it is going to be based on uh, Azure service managed key, or mm -hmm. you have your own key which needs to be used for the encryption. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you have your own key, that key needs to be uploaded in another Azure service called as Azure Key Vault, and that mm -hmm. Key Vault URL you have to specify here. Okay. Right. If you don't have, you can go ahead with service managed key, and this can be changed later on also. Okay. Even few of the previous things like this whitelisting of the networks and IPs, and then this part where uh, I'm looking for free tier discount to be used or not. Account type, redundancy, multi-region rights, availability zone. Everything can be changed after deployment also. Okay, except uh, instance name. Let me subscription yes. name. Okay. I mean the API name. Yes, right. So if these uh, IP addresses will be generated automatically or we can uh, give user defend also, basically? In for, the Cosmos, for the Cosmos DB. Okay. For the Cosmos DB, by default, it will be generating a public IP. But uh -huh. if you have one of public IP of your own already purchased, you can uh -huh. do the mapping for that as well. Okay. Once the service gets created, you can change the IP map. Okay. 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 Yeah. The next, next tags we have already discussed for metadata. Uh -huh. We use them right now. I don't need. So I just click on next. This is the summary of what you have selected, and we will say create. See how simple the deployment is, right? Yeah, very simple. We don't need to do any installation. We just need to give some basic configuration uh, to the instance, right? And all the mapping, deployment, 
is automatically done behind scenes by the Azure portal. I mean, Azure platform. Yeah. So it's deploying it will take few seconds. In fact, a couple of minutes to get it deployed. We can see the status here. We can see the status here in notification also. Mm -hmm. Yes, right. So, uh, okay. In meanwhile, I want to know, like, uh, for example, if I want to, you know, put uh, this technology in my resume, so what uh, yes. the things I have to mention, like, uh, you know, for the job search and all? Uh, come I again. Mean, uh, for example, right now I'm working as Oracle DBA in the Harman. Yes, yes. So if I want to look for the job for on this technology, like uh, I want to put yes. this as well. So then what what will be the yeah, my so role? Your, your profile is DBA, right? Data right, admin. Right. Correct. You can look for Cosmos DBA admin. Oh, OK, yeah. Great. Okay, thank thanks. Now, for that, you need hmm. to know the admin activity for all the APIs that Cosmos DB support. OK, yeah, yeah. because your your actual employer may be working with different kind of services for different projects. Right. We have multiple projects. I mean, we have more than 6000 clients here. Absolutely. So multiple on, uh, different different uh, DB flavors and different different applications also. Yes. We uh, even we have Azure also. Exactly. And right. in that case, uh, the good part is whichever API you use, the DB admin activity is quite similar between all of them. Mm -hmm. 80 percent it is similar 20 percent which is more towards the applications configuration is mm -hmm. what you need to learn for each api and okay. that is not a big deal so okay. you can start with say couple of them to the uh, uh, begin with and uh, later on whenever the requirement comes you can just find out uh, yeah. more details of the other apis as well okay make sense yeah i've got it thank you How much time will it take more? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, one and a half to two minutes it takes. It sometimes depends on your network bandwidth also. Okay. On the server, it gets deployed, but to report it on uh, your browser, it takes time at uh, certain instances. OK. Max five minutes is what it takes. Okay. So you work with Harman, right? Yeah, Harman International. Uh, so you are Pune based? No, Bangalore. Bangalore, okay. Yeah. I've delivered multiple trainings at uh, Harman's Pune location. Oh, is it? Okay. Mostly on Azure and .NET Core and all that. .NET oh, Core. it's great. And because of this lockdown and all, uh, as of now, the virtual trainings are going on. But otherwise, the classroom trainings also are delivered many times there. Yeah, yeah. but I, I was expecting like uh, for this training, more, so many people will be attending. But I don't see much people. Why exactly any particular reason for this? Uh, See, first of all, it's a weekday and uh, people who are involved in the project uh, work probably don't get enough time because we mm -hmm. had multiple subscription act actually for this event also. But mm -hmm. the last minute dropouts are also there. Oh, okay. Even if we get 50 odd uh, nominations out of that, actual uh, attendees would be some uh, 12 to 15 only. Oh, is it? Okay. That's how it is. And uh, just because uh, it's a weekday, first of all. Yeah. And Understood. it's not a planned activity, right? People yeah. will feel that, okay, I would be free on that day, but then suddenly some project work comes and they drop out. Yeah, I understand. No problem. Even I'm also in ship right now, but yeah. 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 It all uh, uh, is about, uh, you know, managing the things. <laughs> yeah, right. Even right now working from home, right? So managing both ways. Right. Sometimes, you know, the, some urgent uh, issues come up with the projects and that's where you have to uh, dedicate more time. Yeah, if it is a yeah. planned activity like a full place training, then most likely you will have full attendance. Yeah, of course, yeah. Okay, so the requirement is complete. Mm -hmm. 
and I'll just click on go to resource either from here or I can uh, click on go to resource from here. Also. Okay. And if I've missed any one of these things, go to resource button entirely. I may say, suppose somehow I came back to the dashboard. How do I reach there? I simply uh, go to resource groups. Group, yeah. I select my resource group demo RG. And yeah. that I see the deployment of Cosmos DB service. Here it is. I click on that and I'm on the Cosmos DB dashboard now. Yeah. Okay. So see here, there is a URL generated based on the name that we gave. OI okay. demo Cosmos DB SRV is what we gave. Dot mm -hmm. documents dot azure dot com. It has automatically taken and it's a SSL secured uh, URL. So 443 port by default use. And mm -hmm. you can see the channel that is used as HTTPS by default. Right? And some of the details it is showing like whether status is online or not, which resource group I am into, which mm -hmm. subscription this service belongs to, subscription ID also displayed, then read locations, write locations, depending mm -hmm. on what we selected earlier, right? multi-region, multi-write uh, uh, location and all that, whether we have selected or not, pre-tier discount, whether we have selected or not, and mm -hmm. then some matrix also. About your service, how healthy the service is going on, how many requests have come in, out of them, how many uh, HTTP 200 status codes were there, 400 uh, series status codes were there, 500 series status codes were there, and then mm -hmm. cost graph also is coming in, right? So for now it says 0, $0.00 dollars, mm -hmm. <coughs> and then on the left hand side here. You can see a lot of other options also like uh, the consistency level and all. Uh, this is especially important if you have multi-region reads and writes. By Got default, it. it goes for patient, but then if you have strong or bounded staleness or eventual, this is something which will decide that how soon the update happened to one of the data center will be available on other data centers. Mm -hmm. In fact, Great part that they have done over here is this graph. So if I select session, I may have inconsistent uh, data availability in different regions at times. Okay. Right. But if I go for strong, which is the most strongest consistency level, I can see once the update happens, it will be consistent across different regions. Mm -hmm. So until and unless it, uh, that change has not been replicated to all the data centers, even mm -hmm. to the current data center also, it won't make it available. It will mm -hmm. show me the old data only. So once okay. the writes happen to all the regions, automatically mm -hmm. the data can be consistently okay. read from any location. You can see yeah. that, right? On its staleness is somewhat different, better than session, but uh, lower than strong. So sequence of the updates coming is exactly same. Just mm -hmm. like strong, but the times at which that uh, uh, data is getting available is different. You can see the gaps over here, right? Right, right. First three regions, I'm getting it absolutely at the same time because they are nearer uh, regions. Probably there is a farther region where I'm getting the update at some later time, right? Okay. Then we have consistent prefix. Here also the sequence will be the same, but then. In between that also we have the gaps. Okay. Uh, then, yes, I, have, I have a question. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, there is, I think you have shown one URL, right? URL has been generated and they, you, there is a yes. uh, default port, um, port number 443 has been allocated, right? Yes. So my question is like, uh, for example, if you are, this is a container, uh, like demo RG is a container and in the single container, I think we can create multiple instances, right? So yes. when you create another instance, then what will be the port number next? Port number will be 443 only. Then how I think it will be same port that is, number. That is managed by your domain services behind scenes. Right okay. on the same port number, URL is eventually going to be different, right? So yes, physically sir, you... the server will be different in that case. Okay, okay, yeah, understand. You, you have virtual machines backing this system. So different virtual machine means, okay, across two different machines, I may mm -hmm. still have the same port number used, right? Okay. Yes. So it's all about the DNS management. Now yeah, we are yeah. talking about changing some of those features later on after deployment, right? So if yeah. I go to firewall and virtual network, see this whitelisting of the networks can be done from here as mm -hmm. well. Yeah. Right. 
and then i have private endpoint connection which is an extension of that only which was combined in uh, de deployment uh, configuration right mm -hmm. so here i have two options all networks and selected networks and then private endpoint i have here okay. where i can uh, whitelist individual ip addresses mm -hmm. then we have uh, keys which is going to be important for us which provide me the uri the endpoint basically and the key to access that uri that is something like password if mm -hmm. i'm using restful apis i have two keys if one fails the second key is there to okay. work with do and we then, can we take yeah. the backup of these keys or it's yes, not, required? Uh, not required actually if you want mm -hmm. you can take but uh, not required you can regenerate them if you lost them or if you okay. feel uh, that some of the key is compromised you can get it regenerated from here mm -hmm. okay ellipsis button is there if you click that regenerate primary key regenerate secondary key option comes and then connection string automatically is based on this primary key and this uri you can see account mm -hmm. endpoint is one of the key here which mm -hmm. refers to this and then account key is something which refers to this so yeah. primary connection string is based on primary key secondary connection string is based on secondary Second. key i'll just get one of the key copied from here and say paste it somewhere here for our future reference okay and then we have option for scale wherein we can change the deployment how we are looking for it Okay, I see there is some issue here. The UI getting loaded for scale is not the correct one. Okay. Okay, we'll look into this. Here, basically, we can change the throughput and all that. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, free tier, whether it needs to be used or not, and then how I'm going to pay, all that can be changed from this. That, that could be a temporary issue for all uh, the details here. It is showing the same UI. Uh, okay. Most likely some upgradation must be happening behind scenes. Uh -huh. okay. okay. Anyways, you can uh, explore this. Yeah, okay. Then uh, I have something called as data explorer over here. This is just like query explorer that is provided uh -huh. by most of the RDBMSs. Like uh -huh. uh, have that uh, SQL plus for Oracle, right? Yes, right. And uh, for uh, SQL Server, you have uh, SQL Server Management Studio. Correct. And somewhat similar you have for other RDBMSs also. So this Data Explorer is pretty much the same thing. Uh, just that it is browser based. Here, now within SQL API, I said that it stores all the data in JSON document format. Right. And okay. those documents uh, basically are individual records. Those records are stored in something what we call as containers. Formerly, we used to call them as document collections. Mm -hmm. And now that is named as container. And then containers are stored in the databases. So how do we relate to RDBMS? Database is database. Uh, what we used to call a stable in RDBMS, here it is called as container. And mm -hmm. then the records are basically called as documents over here or okay. items. Okay. So here you can see we have something called a SQL API. Here mm -hmm. I want a new database to be created on the top because container can go inside the database only. First mm -hmm. thing I need to do is I need to create a database. So I click mm -hmm. on new database from here. This small drop down gave mm -hmm. me the menu for new container, new database. I select new database and here on the right hand side I get the UI for it. Asking for database ID, that is database name. I'll call this as demo db and for throughput i'll go with the default uh, stuff 400 that anyways is free for me see it says 0 0.032 dollars per hour 0 0.077 daily 23.36 dollars monthly in one region so if i have more than one regions then multiplied by number of regions will be the cost that i'll be paying as of now, this is going to be zero for me because up to 400 are used. It's free, free. Correct. According to the free. It's, it's, it's paid here as well. 
with three tier discount, you will get first 400 RUs and 5 GB of storage in this account for free. Charges will apply if your resource throughput exceeds pro data. Oh. <coughs> Even if you want to know how the RUs are calculated, you can just click on learn more and you can mm. see the documentation. Yeah. Just say OK here and database gets created for me within a few seconds. My internet connection is a little bit slower today. Yeah, yeah, I understand. And we are on the uh, video chat as well, so definitely because of that also, some mm -hmm. bandwidth is going. Anyways, that's created here. Okay. Yeah. This is database, typically like a database. Mm -hmm. right? I didn't give any configuration about where it will be stored, how it will be so stored, and all Correct. that. It is going to be automatically managed by the service provider. Okay. Okay. Accessibility, like which user can do what and all that, I can uh, set from here, access control. If I go to access control, IAM, that is identity and access management, I can basically do all the role assignment and all. Typical okay. admin stuff, right? Yeah. Come back to Data Explorer. My database has been already created here. So the next thing what I'm looking for is to create a sample container to start with. Though all these things can be done programmatically as well, but at times we need to pre-create our structure, right? So yes, right. This UI can be used. I just say mm -hmm. new container. Just like database, it is asking for a few things, container ID and few more details. Now here, the first thing it is asking for is database ID. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I have two choices create new or existing. existing. Yeah. If I've already created a database in which I want to create this container, I'll select that database from this list. Mm -hmm. After selecting use existing, if I have mm -hmm. not created any database, I can say create new and I mm -hmm. can create database from here. Okay. As we have already created one, I'll go for use existing and select demo DB. Container ID, let's say, is named as incomes and then indexing i want it to be totally automatic we mm -hmm. don't need to create or manage the indexes mm -hmm. uh, and then there is a concept of partition so i hope partition should be or partitioning should be should not be a new thing for you i believe yeah Oracle, yeah. Green SQL correct. also supports that. correct correct table partition all. yeah exactly so what is that and what it is used for yeah, it will be partition will be created like, you know, for example, uh, for example, any user is accessing particular, you know, table now. So it should not scan the all the tables. So it's it has to be scanned only particular partition only from this range. So for example, I have given the date, for example, this date to this date, it has to be get the information from this particular date only. So it will uh, in from that partition only, it will fetch the data. Yes. So instead of scanning and reading the whole mm -hmm. file for that table, we can restrict it to read only a fragment correct, and that correct. makes my query faster and yes. indexing more better right correct right this is pretty much the same as we are on cloud the data is not guaranteed to be stored in one single physical storage device mm -hmm. uh, it can be put into multiple uh, different disks also right mm -hmm. even in the same data center as well they may have hundreds mm -hmm. and thousands of disks installed Mm -hmm. Okay, now here, how do I manage all that storage more efficiently is where the partition key plays the role, right? So I can say there is a partition key based on a certain field in my uh, uh, table and mm -hmm. uh, the data where the value of that particular field is same, mm -hmm. uh, the system has to take care of that. The data gets stored on one same physical disk or at mm -hmm. least the nearest disk possible if the okay. storage is not in. And that's okay. what partitioning is doing here. So mm -hmm. I say from my fields, what I'm going to store, there is one field called as country based mm -hmm. on which I want my partitioning to happen. So I say slash country in the path mode, it needs to be given because the data is stored in JSON document format. And JSON, mm -hmm. uh, the read operation for JSON is always with the path. Hence, okay. I say slash country. 
Okay. Right? So this is my partitioning key. Mm -hmm. And then here I say, okay, there is one more option, provision dedicated throughput for this container. Mm -hmm. Dedicated throughput means I can say that, okay, my data is this much and I want out of overall uh, throughput that has been configured, that is 400 RUs for now. I want 200 RUs to be dedicated entirely for this container. Mm -hmm. And rest of the container should use uh, the, the shared uh, availability from that remaining 200 RUs, right? So okay. in that case, I can go here and say, okay, 200 RUs are dedicated for this container. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if I want, I can say that, okay, I want uh, shared uh, throughput only to be used. I don't want dedicated throughput. And this, nice. this puts some effect on cost also. If I say 200, mm -hmm. only 200 is remaining in shared mode. And suppose Correct. there is usage of 300 RUs mm -hmm. there in shared mode, I would be required to pay for 100 RUs, which, which is actually the extra 100 RU. 200 Correct. plus 300 becomes 500 there. And yes, the reality could be even this container is using only 50 RUs at time, right? I'm not using all 200 RUs. I will mm -hmm. go for this when I know that, okay, minimum this much of RU usage will be there for this container most of the time. Maybe some kind of transactional data is there. So I may want this data to be read and uh, written very frequently. Probably then it, it makes sense to go for provisioning dedicated mm -hmm. throughput, right? Mm -hmm. And this can be changed later on as well. Okay. I'll go for okay. If I want any unique key to be added, there was an option here, add unique key. Mm -hmm. Now see, nowhere we have given the structure for the container. Right. Right. There is no column definition that I have provided. So this is within, yeah. yeah, this RU can be changed, right? Later on, for example, if customer requires, he wants some, you know, extra storage and all so he can change it, it yes, can be yes. modified right that, that is done with the help of the scale and all that okay, RUs okay. also can be changed okay fine right, so if you go here and if you go to settings you get the option to actually go for changing the RUs and all the mm -hmm. resulting ui will give you a lot of options there okay, okay. so uh, i was talking about there is no structure given to this uh, container mm -hmm. usually when you create table in a database you mm -hmm. give the structure, right? You give the yeah. queries, uh, I mean, column structure and all. Correct, yes. Why is it so? Because this is NoSQL implementation. NoSQL says that one record may have four columns, the other record may have 40 columns, the other record may have 400 columns also. Yes, sir. Correct? The structure of every record may be different. Different, right. Right, and that's why the structure of the data will be decided by row, not by the column. Okay. In RDBMS, the structure is decided by columns and not uh, by the rows. Correct. Okay, so each row will have schema instead of mm -hmm. each, uh, uh, instead of column defining the schema of the table. Okay, mm -hmm. so I just have items collection here within which I can add some data. Uh, two of the key columns are displayed by default. The, by mm -hmm. default, the primary key role will be played by a a uh, field called as ID, and mm -hmm. then the slash country represents our partitioning key. Okay. okay. Now, when I add item, I must have ID and slash country. Inside mm -hmm. that, I can have any columns of my choice. In every record, I may have different number of columns. I say new item. Mm -hmm. When I say new item, the right side editor becomes a typical text editor and mm -hmm. see what it is asking for. It is just asking for some JSON formatted data. Mm -hmm. Zoom this out. And we'll put some details there. This better option is, I go for creating the structure in Notepad. Okay, so let's say here I put my JSON document which is always in curly braces. JSON stands for JavaScript object notation. How do you define objects in JavaScript? Okay. Let's say I have ID as the first field, which is mandatory field. Mm -hmm. Here I say the ID is India.incomes.1. Grammatically, if I'm doing this, I can add UID also added to this from mm -hmm. the program. 
I have another field called as name. Let's say I call this as red. Mm -hmm. Then I say country, which is a mandatory field. ID and country is mandatory because ID is mm -hmm. unique ID and country yeah. is partition key. Correct. So this country can have null value stored into it. Mm -hmm. Right, but the field has to exist there in the uh, data structure. Right. Let's say country here is India, and then I have another field called as income. It's got the value, let's say, eight hundred. Mm -hmm. Numeric value, so quotes are not needed. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I'll create two, three records like this. So I just copy this, paste it here. I make this two. I say this is in J. Let's say this is two thousand. Again, paste. Let's say this is three. This is AD. Here I have four thousand. We one more. Let's say this is four. And then, and here this is eight thousand. Okay. Okay. So one by one, I'll just copy this, go back to the portal, mm -hmm. delete this uh, default schema which was generated, paste mm -hmm. my own schema, mm -hmm. and I click on save. Okay. Document gets created, and you can see there are some additional properties also added. These Correct. are all system properties. Correct. TSS timestamp attachments. If I have given any other documents reference over here. Mm -hmm. E tag is basically used for uh, you know the versioning. Uh, I mean, if the data is getting uh, edited by two users simultaneously, mm -hmm. whether the concurrency, I mean, how the concurrency needs to be taken care of, that okay. is decided by E tag. Okay. And then self is self reference, reference of this document itself, and then mm -hmm. RID is the unique ID of the container having this record stored mm -hmm. into it. Okay. Now, likewise, I want to create other records. So I say new item once again, mm -hmm. delete this existing schema, mm -hmm. copy the next record, paste, save. I can save this file as a JSON uh, file also, mm -hmm. and I can say upload, right, by using upload item. Yes. The other way around. I say new item again. It's deleted. Copy the third set of data. Paste. Save. New item one last time. Copy. This paste. Save. Okay, so here I can see the country value and the ID value getting displayed straight away. And when I click on any of this row, it mm -hmm. actually shows. And Correct. one of this record, I could have added additional fields also if required. Yes, right. OK, so there is no structured storage. It is partially structured storage. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is how I play with the data here. Any questions so far? No, it's all good. Yeah, I'm fine with it. Okay, now let's move on to the programmability side where we will see how do we create the procedures and use them? How do we create the triggers and use okay. them? How do we create the functions and use them? Okay, yeah, yeah. So maybe we can start with functions first of all. Yeah, can we, have, we can, um, can we have some yeah. five minutes of break? Uh, is that possible? Yeah, no issues. Let's have five minutes of break. We'll resume the session at 12 40. Sure, thank you. Yeah. yeah.
Okay, shall we start? Yeah, sure. Please. Thanks. Great. So we till now created a Cosmos DB account in which we created demo DB database instance yes. and where we created the container right. named as income with uh, four different records added to it, right? Mm -hmm. okay. So now we'll see how do we create the user defined function. That's the easiest one out of the lot. So okay. first we'll see that. A little bit of development features, but not very difficult to understand. I'll mm -hmm. just go to Visual Studio. Mm -hmm. 2019 is what I'm using. And here I've selected the language as C sharp platform as all platform and mm -hmm. the type of project as console. Okay. To keep it simple. I'm just going with console app. Console mm -hmm. app.net core is what I'm selecting. Mm -hmm. I need to give it a name. So I'll call this as DNC demo. Features in Cosmos. And I want this to be put on desktop. Click on create. Soon a small C sharp program will be created for us. Mm -hmm. So here it is. In this, we need to do a few things. Mm -hmm. here, I delete this console dot write line statement from here, and then I go to tools, menu, new get package manager, package manager console, mm -hmm. which opens a PowerShell window here. Mm -hmm. Okay, now here I need to get the package installed. The install package the library that allows me to interact with Cosmos DB service that we have created. Mm -hmm. Name is Microsoft Azure dot Cosmos and press enter. This will automatically download, install, configure the library for my project. With all the dependencies. So mm -hmm. done. The next thing I'm going to do here is import two namespaces here. We are going to use all along this. So I'll go with system dot Collections. <laughs> then system dot io. Then system dot threading dot tasks. And and that we got installed as a library. So Microsoft.azure.cosmos. Microsoft.azure.cosmos.scripts. Okay. Mm -hmm. From where we are going to use different kind of functionality one by one. Okay. okay. Now, there are two things. One is the function uh, that we need, want to create, and the other part is where we want to uh, invoke that function. Now, when it comes to program, the invocation most likely comes with the program. Creation of function uh, can be done directly on the portal uh, here by selecting the container for which we want to create the function, and then use a defined function. I can select and I can say, uh yeah uh these, this button i'll use the drop down and here i can say new udf 
-hmm. If I click this here, I can write my function with the function ID that I want. By this okay. ID, I would be able to do the invocation at the program level. Okay. okay. Other way around, because this is just the web editor, it may not be very comfortable to work with. Uh, mm -hmm. I may want Visual Studio to be used even to develop the function and deploy the function. Okay. Right? So that's what you will be doing for now. But it is just a matter of writing that same function on the portal directly. Okay? Mm -hmm. You can do either of the things. Okay. Now here we go to Visual Studio once again. And First, I'll create a helper function here where all the invocation code I'm going to put as I'm going to call it in main, which is static. I'll define this function also as static. Okay. I want this to be an asynchronous function. So I say async task. Mo UDF is the name of the function that I want. That will be having all the payload that uh, this demo requires. And in main, somewhere I need to say demo UDF async is what I'll name it. And in main, I'll say await and the name of that function demo UDF async mm -hmm. and semi. Now, to have this await used over here, I need to say static async going in the definition of this main and getting replaced with task. Right now, the actual code goes here. A uh, few of the things that I'm going to share across all the three, four demos that I'm going to show you. Uh, so I'll put them here. Let's say we have static string. That is connection string that connects my program to my Cosmos DB account. So this mm -hmm. connection string can come from the, the Configuration file also, so that I don't need to hard code. Mm -hmm. For now, to keep the demo simple, I'm just putting it hard coded. And here I go back to Notepad where we have our connection string recorded already. Remember, we copied this? Yes, I will copy. This a key. Copy this and we paste it here. The next thing that I'll define here is an instance of Cosmos client class. Client as new Cosmos client. This also I'll define as static. Mm -hmm. That in static methods, I can use them. And this Cosmos client requires a connection string to be passed to it. So I will pass CS here, right? So this will establish the connection. Then I have another static variable of string type mm -hmm. named as dbid, which holds my database name. Mm -hmm. So the name that we have given to the database is demo db. Mm -hmm. So pass that demo db here. And then, This is something which is common. The rest of the things I'll put in directly over here in the function. So here I have a string container ID, which I'll name as incomes. This is the name. Income, yes. Okay. And then here I create the instance of something called as container. In fact, this container I'll create here itself as a static container. Mm -hmm. Equals to null. And then here I say container, that same container object. I'm saying client. Mm -hmm. get container which asks me the database ID and container ID to be passed. So we have defined the right. variables here. DB ID and container ID that I'll pass here. Okay. DB ID, comma. Container, container ID, I'll pass here. 
So this will get the reference of the container incomes. Mm -hmm. Then I say there is another string variable named as UDF ID, that is user defined function ID. Mm -hmm. I want my function to be named as UDF tax. Mm -hmm. Programmatically, I'm going to create and programmatically, I'm going to invoke. Mm -hmm. Okay. Wait. Start scripts. Container is the container reference, and scripts allows me to run scripts on that container. Okay. Mm -hmm. The script that I'm looking to run is for create. See, we have some create statements here. Create stored procedure async, create trigger async, create user defined function async. Right. So for now, yeah. what we are looking for is function. Just say create user defined functions async. And there I need to pass the instance of user defined function properties. Mm -hmm. I simply say new user defined function properties. Mm -hmm. And with object initializer feature, I'll get the properties initialized. So I put curly braces there mm -hmm. and make it multi line for making it readable. I need to set a couple of properties. First is ID of the function, which I'll simply say UDF ID. We have already defined that as UDF text. Mm -hmm. right? I put comma here and then I say body of the function which is the code of the function that goes here mm -hmm. as some JavaScript file I need to pass over here. Mm -hmm. The JavaScript file is yet to be created, right? So mm -hmm. I'll just hold this here and I go to solution explorer window here on right side. If not mm -hmm. visible, we can take it from view solution explorer. So we come here, we right click on the project file, the second one. Mm -hmm. It has got C shops and mall on it. Just right click, add new item. And what I'm looking for is a JavaScript file because the function definition can always go in JavaScript mm -hmm. format. Mm -hmm. I cannot create the UDFs or procedures or triggers as C sharp language based implementation. It has to be always JavaScript. So here I go and select web on the left hand side. Uh -huh. Under that, I select scripts and select uh, in JavaScript. I don't see you. Oh, great. So I just select web and here I can see JavaScript file. Correct. I name yeah. this file as UDF tax. Uh -huh. Yes, extension it will automatically take. Mm -hmm. It will be an empty file. And the first thing I need to do is select this file, right click, properties. I want a copy of this file to be put into my project's output directory. So mm -hmm. here in the properties, the second property we have copied to output directory is what I'll select to copy always. Okay. Whatever changes I make here, by default, it will be copying the contents of the file to the output directory where okay. my project binaries will be placed. And mm -hmm. there comes now the function definition itself. Mm -hmm. So I create a simple JavaScript function here, function named as UDF tax. I take a parameter named as income, which represents one income document from Power collection. Okay. So one document at a time I'll pass to this function and we'll do some calculation based on the income, right? We have income. We yes. Have the income tax calculation based on this. Yes. So income is representing one object out of that. Here I say if income greater than equal equal, equal undefined. That is null. There is no parameter passed. I'll just throw the exception here that gives me the text message as no input. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. Else, I proceed and go for another if statement where I check if income is less than 1000. Mm -hmm. We have slabs, right? So that's what I'm trying to simulate here. Return. 10%, 20%, 30%. So I say return income asterisk 0 0.1, that is 10%. Uh huh. Yes, if income is less than ten thousand, that is one thousand one to ten thousand. Okay. Mm -hmm. Return twenty percent of the income. So I say income as first zero point. Two. I'll say, or in fact, I can say for everything else, 10,000 to higher. Uh -huh. <clears throat> so let's say return income asterisk 0 0.3. Okay. Yeah. This is the functions body mm -hmm. or the functions code. I could have created this function directly on portal by saying yeah. user defined function and saying new uh, UDM, right? Directly yeah. that same code I could have written here itself. Then. Yes. Right now what I'm doing is I'm looking to develop this function in okay. Visual Studio and deploy via Visual Studio programmatically. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's what I need to refer over here in body. Okay. And what I do there is body should call that uses the class called as file, mm -hmm. which provides me a function called as read all text. Mm -hmm. I want to read the contents of that JavaScript file. Mm -hmm. I said dollar prefix to double quotes, wherein I put curly braces. I pass UDF ID variable here dot js. So it will dynamically read the contents of that file. This is, remember, this is not a call of the function. Here I'm just reading uh -huh. the contents of this file. Okay. And those contents I am writing into the function on server. So okay. instead of using the portal's UI, I am using this program to create that function for me. Mm -hmm. Right? So the contents okay. I'm passing to create user defined function, which will create function mm -hmm. by default in the backend. Okay. And then here I say the code for calling this function is written. So I say var iterator is equal to container dot get item query iterator. I'm looking for some random type because the structure of the record can be different right as we discussed yes and then the query goes into this mm -hmm. so here i say my query because we are using sql core api right that allows mm -hmm. me to use sql query language to query the data from the database mm -hmm. so i can use select statement select asterisk from what i'm looking for is i'm looking for all the records to be displayed where Mm -hmm. The tax on the income is greater than or equal to 1000. Yes. Right. And I want that to be calculated on the flag. So here I say from incomes, that's my collection, which holds the data actually. I give an alias to this incomes. Let's say I. Where I say UDF, that's a predefined keyword here, where I'll put in caps, where UDF dot name of the function now needs to be given here. So it is UDF tax. In fact, what I can do to make it better is here I put dollar and Instead of hard coding this and symbol, curly brace. 
UDF mm. tax I pass here. UDF ID I pass here. Right, so UDF dot UDF tax in the parameter to be passed here. So I say I dot that is representing the individual record. Mm -hmm. uh, what I want to pass is income. Mm -hmm. so each records income field will be picked up mm -hmm. and passed to the function that we have created here, UDF tax, and the tax will be calculated. And what I'm looking for is the outcome of that tax should be greater than or equal to 1000 as per our requirement. So only those records will be displayed where the calculated tax is more than or equal to 1000. Mm -hmm. It should be this way, greater than or equal. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, this is just a query definition I've given. Okay. The query will not execute until and unless I start reading from it, from the mm -hmm. results. Okay. So I say there is a while loop which checks whether this iterator object has got some results to process or not. Mm -hmm. And if it has, I want to collect those results one by one. So I say where results equals await iterator dot read next. One by one, the record I want to read. There can be multiple collections uh, returned. Hence, I once again go for an iterator pattern that is for each. For each where item in results. Results because there can be more than one. So I'll just rename this. I just want that to be displayed as it is on the screen. So here I say, display the item. Okay. The yeah. JSON format it has to display. Save and let's execute. So what first time this code will run successfully, second time it may fail because second time we will be looking to recreate that function again. Yeah. So maybe right. we can put a condition if that function is already created, don't process this part of the code. Mm -hmm. Ignore that. If it is not created, then uh, basically go ahead and create it. Okay. Understand? Yeah, I've got it. So that, that's an improvisation in code which can be later on done. So I'll just say control F5. That is run the code. Control key plus F5 basically will compile the code mm -hmm. and execute. Says build succeeded. Take some time because the function needs to be created first of all, after which the query needs to execute and then it shows me a couple of records, right? Yeah. I can see India incomes two and India incomes mm -hmm. four, and the income is 8,000 and 15,000 because the tax in these two cases only is coming out more than 1,000. Yes. For less than 800, it is, uh, I mean, less than 1000, it is uh, going to be 10%, which is 80 for 800. Mm -hmm. right? If we look at the records, we have 800 as first. So here it will be 80, which is not qualified. Mm -hmm. And so India incomes three, if I see, we have income as 4000. This comes in second slab where we are calculating 20%. So it will be 800 which is okay. still less than 1,000, not qualified. If I see India incomes two, it is 15,000. This goes in 30% category, definitely will be more than 1,000. And okay. India incomes four also is 8,000. This goes in 20%, but still mm -hmm. it goes more than 1,000. So it is also qualified. And hence Correct. these two records are getting displayed. Right. On the fly, as a part of the query, we are successfully able to call the function and do the job for us, right? Mm, yes. And we are getting the output. And that means the function also must have been created successfully. Where to see mm. and how to see. So I just try refreshing from here. Sometimes this refresh button may not give me the uh, function definition displayed here. Mm -hmm. yeah, like right now it's not showing me anything. No worries, okay. I'll just refresh the complete browser. And in this case, it's guaranteed that I should be able to see the function. Okay. 
complete reload happens here. Let it be rendered. Here I expand demo DB, incomes collection, user defined functions. Do you see UDF tags? Yes. Select this. And yeah. do you see this function deployed here? Correct. So that's what I said. I could have created the function right over here also. You're right. By saying mm -hmm. new UDF. I could have given the ID here. I could have mm -hmm. written the function here itself directly. So next Correct. demos where we are going to see procedures and triggers, mm -hmm. we will actually use this UI to create the procedures and triggers. Okay. You know, both ways uh, you can mm -hmm. understand that okay, this is possible. So any okay. questions here regarding the functions? Uh, yeah, it's fine. No, 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 nothing from my end. Okay, so I'll just close this file UDF tax dot mm -hmm. And let's move on to the next part where we want a procedure to be created that adds mm -hmm. some new uh, records to some uh, other collection, right? Yeah, it would be good actually if you provide me anything, something future reference documents or something. Because yeah. if, you know, by after session I cannot uh, remember all those things, right? So at least I have to. Yeah. So two things I'll be doing. One, the session recording will be shared with you. Mm -hmm. It takes some half an hour or so to get processed and created. Recording yep. already is happening. Yes, uh, right. my colleague Preeti will uh, share that with you. Uh, she would upload it to YouTube and link will be shared. Okay. And uh, beside that, the reference I'll just give you right away. Sure. Yeah, thanks. As I said, it's better to refer the official documentation. That's okay. the link I'm sharing with you. And this sure. is pretty exhaustive. You can see lots of samples, code mm -hmm. samples, admin activities, everything there. So, so basically, if you if you want to work on the Moam or Cosmos DB, so it is mandatory we have to learn the JSON. Uh yeah, a little bit of uh, JSON understanding will help. Like in SQL Server, what happens for Oracle or uh, all the other RDBMS, you directly play with the data. Yeah, for creating yeah. the sample data, but here that direct data itself is JSON, and okay. it's not very difficult as mm -hmm. you might have uh, uh, seen. Uh, let me go back to where we created the structure. It is just key and value pair separated mm -hmm. by com with the other key value pair. Yes, that's right. And this can be nested also. I mean, here the next field could itself be like this, say other data, right? And yeah. then the value of this can be another JSON object. Mm -hmm. So here okay. again, I can have key and followed by value, comma, mm -hmm. and so on. Where okay. once again, I can have nested data as well. So this okay. is JSON. Okay. So not very difficult. Initially, it looks different because mm -hmm. we have never worked with that. But Correct. once you start using it, you become used to it. Okay. Fine. Sure. So let me go to the chat box and put the link for the reference. Mm -hmm. Take your chat box. Yeah, I got it. Bookmark that and you will be able to go there anytime. Sure. Thanks. <coughs> okay. So what we are doing is looking to create a stored procedure. And for that, what uh, requirement we have is it adds a couple of records to another container. So for that, I'm going to create one more container. Mm -hmm. So for everything, we have to create new containers? Uh, not really, but my demo is not now based on incomes container. Okay. That is a that is using some different type of data. Uh -huh. Yeah, the other way around, your functions, your procedures, your triggers will all be tightly coupled to your containers. Okay. Mm -hmm. And because now the structure of data that I'm going to use for stored procedures and triggers uh, mm -hmm. is of a different structure. That's why I'm not using incomes. I'm yeah, creating yeah. another container which will be common for the next three demos now. Okay. Okay. So here I say once again ellipsis button new container mm -hmm. and oh, database ID it has taken container ID I give as sample mm -hmm. and I'll click on OK. Mm -hmm. Oh, partition key I missed. So I'll say slash category is one of the field that I'm going to use. 
so category is the partition key it's mandatory by the way okay if you have nothing to do uh, like that then you can put id also but then it won't make much uh, contribution right id will be always unique so for yeah. every record there will be new partitions created right is created okay so i'll just collapse incomes and sample collection is already there i'm mm -hmm. not going to add any data over here as my program is the procedure is going to do that for me correct yes, okay sir? okay now what i'm looking for is a new procedure to be created mm -hmm. So how do we create a new procedure? Here we have this uh, button. Yes. I click on the drop down and click on new stored procedure. Yes. Alternatively, I can do this from program, right? Yes, right. UDF tags, I'll just close. And here I am on stored procedure. The name of the stored procedure that I want to use is something that starts with SP that's a standard uh, naming convention, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say it is named as SP create to do items. My sample container is going to have to do items created into it. So mm -hmm. that becomes my procedure ID. And then I need to write my function. So I just delete all the stuff. This is sample uh, stored procedure automatically created for me. Okay. Uh, I can take some help from here or else I can just write my, uh, something of my own. So I'll put yeah. that first in notepad and we'll come back here. Okay, so let's say our stored procedure looks like some JavaScript. Mm -hmm. So I say function. What is the name that we have used, the ID? SP create to do items. So I'll prefer to use the same name here. SP create to do items, though it's not mandatory. Mm -hmm. This name will never be exposed. The mm -hmm. name that is exposed is always what you have given as ID. Okay. This takes in some items collection, which will be to do items precisely as input from the program. Then here I say first get connected to the collection, which is actually the container. So okay. uh, JavaScript uses a little bit older SDK, hence the names are different over here. Okay. Container previously used to call as collection. Mm -hmm. So I say create the instance of collection. Mm -hmm. And in JavaScript, how do I get the connectivity is by calling a direct method called as get context, mm -hmm. which gives me the context. In which, if I say get container, it will give me container. If I say get database, it will give me database. If mm -hmm. I say get collection, it will give me container. Okay. On this, I directly go for get collection method being called. I don't want context. I want con a collection from the context. So okay. I go this way. Then I want uh, the link for the collection, the path of that collection. So here I say collection link that is equal to the collection that we found in the previous step mm -hmm. dot i say get self link on reference it basically takes mm -hmm. in which the procedure is associated and running i say where count there is another variable that is set to zero to start with there is a if statement based on the state of the items, the variable that we are getting as parameter here. If not items will return true if the item says null. If it has got some data, this will return false and if statement won't process, right? So if it is null, in that case, what I'm looking for is, Throw an exception. So I say throw new error. Gives me the message as the items collection 
is undefined or null. So basic parameter checking is what we are doing. Then here I say where num items, number of items mm -hmm. equal to items dot length. That tells me how many uh, documents I want to add. Mm -hmm. Then there is another if statement which goes in checks if this num items. I mean that array has come, but it may have no records to process, right? It may have zero records. So I check okay. if the length is zero. Throw. I don't want to throw the exception this time. I want to say get context. Once again, dot get response. Mm -hmm. Get body. Zero. I want to set the response itself to zero. That means nothing processed. OK. And as there was no data, I didn't do anything, uh, which is fairly enough because at times I might have clicked the save button uh, accidentally, right? Where there yeah. is no data to be added. And then I say call an helper method named as try create, which is not yet written. We will create this method shortly. OK. Parameters taken by this para, uh, this method. Uh, the first one is items count. Mm -hmm. The last record. OK, and yeah. then I say call back. There is another method, helper method, which has been created by the name call back. OK. And then here I have another function. Simply two functions we need to create, right? Uh, the first is try create, the second is call back. So I say here goes function try create, which takes in two parameters as the call itself confirms. So first is item, comma, one record at a time, I mean. And mm -hmm. for that record, what to be done will be processed by callback function. So callback also is taken as parameter. Then here I say there is a variable named as options. What I'm looking for is uh, I don't want to pass the ID value explicitly like what we did for the uh, incomes, right? We are doing India in dot incomes dot one and India incomes dot two and so yeah. on. I want yeah. that to be system generated for me. So for yeah. that, here I go ahead and say set the option with the name disable automatic ID generation which is true by default. That's why the ID is not automatically generated. If I set this to false, it will be auto generated. Then I say where is accepted. There is another variable mm -hmm. which will store the status of my actual operation where I say collection. Mm -hmm. Collection that we have created here. Dot. Create document. This mm -hmm. is like create the record for me. Insert mm -hmm. the record for me. Where mm -hmm. to insert. I want to insert in the current collection. So I say collection link comma. What to insert the item itself that has come in as parameter here. Right, the last record getting inserted first as per this logic until and unless that doesn't become zero. Right here, you see. Yes. Okay. So, point is all records to be added. Okay. Yeah. And with the options that we have defined in this options variable, so that ID will be generated automatically even if it is not passed. Mm -hmm. And then, once again, once the addition is completed, the callback needs to be called mm -hmm. the helper method. So mm -hmm. that this this entirely gets uh, re-executed until unless the items to be processed become zero. Okay. Then here I say if not is accepted. That means the status says it has failed. I 
I want to once again restart the process. So here I say get context dot get response dot set body count. Overall logic says that it has to be iterated until and unless all records are not completely processed. And then finally, this function named as callback needs to be created here. So here I say function named as callback that takes in a parameter named as error representing error, item representing the record, comma, options, any configuration options that we might have provided. So here we simply first of all check if there is an error. If error, throw as it is, rethrow the error if there is an error. Otherwise, say count plus plus. And then we say if count is greater than or equal to num items. Mm -hmm. get context dot get response dot set body to count and finish so this is exit criteria okay else right because iteratively the same thing is going to be called again and again so i say try create Items, more items are there. So I say items count comma call itself is so this is something what we call as a recursion function calling itself again and again, right? So this basically means that whatever the uh, number of records we have, process all of them, get them created, and mm -hmm. once there is nothing to be processed further, just come out. So that's my function. I just copy this. One more thing to look at. One main function has been created, and these two helper functions are created as the part of this function only. Okay, like this is required. Yes, yeah, so, uh, nested functions. This okay. is required because procedure can be created as one single function definition on the top. That's mm -hmm. first thing. Second thing is here, these two functions are making use of the variables that are mm -hmm. defined locally inside this function. Right, okay. so they need to be the member of this function that that way also. Okay. Right. Yeah. Right. Copy this. Go back to portal and paste it here. So all the function definition is ready. I just click on save. My function gets created mm -hmm. as a stored procedure. Okay. Right. So in Oracle, you use PLSQL to create the stored procs. In uh, SQL Server, we use Transact SQL to create stored procs, SPs is what we call them, right? Uh, here we use JavaScript to create the SPs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now yeah. it's all about calling this function. So how do we call? Let's proceed to Visual Studio. Calling has to be programmatically, right? Yes, right. Uh, I just say collapse this demo UDF thing. Comment this call to demo UDF because I don't want that to be executed again. And there we start. Create another helper method first of all. Mm -hmm. Static async task demo sp async. And just like what we did earlier, I'll make a call to this in main. Demo SP async. And the actual code will go here now. Okay. So how it goes? There are some common things already. Mm -hmm. <coughs> we'll reuse them. Okay. Here I directly start with container ID mm -hmm. because this time the container ID is different. So I say string container ID equal to what is the name of container we have given? Sample. Sample, yes. Let's confirm. 
example with a small right so i say this is sample that contains my stored procedure then i define another string variable here that represents spid what is the name or id that we have used for the procedure it's sp create create to do to do items that's what it is then yeah. we instantiate our container object by saying container equals find already initialized on the top dot get container what it takes in db id comma container id right like what we did in functions and then here i say create an array that represents my new items to be added so i say there is a data type called as dynamic that makes it actually dynamic based on what is assigned it will decide what is the data type okay let's say it is named as new items equals new dynamic array that is represented here i use array initializer so here goes my first object again dynamic object i create so i just say new curly brace and in that then i define my properties as automatic id generation we have enabled there we can ignore id property we can directly start from other properties let's say category which is our partition key that is equal to let's say personal comma oops this should be without double quotes we are not in javascript m equals to let's say groceries and description equals to let's say pick up strawberries and because it's a new task we are adding i'll say there is a property named as is complete that is false right just like to do items we add okay and then i copy and paste this record mm -hmm. here after the comma and i change few things there like let's say this is doctor and the task description is make an appointment or check up okay okay is complete is again false last comma i'll remove because this is last record okay. and just after this definition here i say var result equals await container dot scripts remember we spoke about this during functions yeah. right that allowed us to execute function so here this allows me to execute stored procedure so i say execute stored procedure as thing yes that take in parameter of type string that is representing the stored procedure id i have already got sp id defined for that purpose correct comma next thing it is asking for is partition key i'll say new partition key created on mm -hmm. the value that is personal okay okay comma the last thing is the actual data so here i say new array based on the dynamic array that we have created here that is new items clear clear as well 
pass both these records as a array into the function that we have created and then that comes over here definitely error is not going to be thrown length will be 2 in our case mm -hmm. uh, now my terms is not going to be zero so directly it moves on to try create where it takes one item at a time okay items of zero items of one one by one and then gets it created okay right so let's test this control f5 on console we are not going to get any output as we have not given any message here mm -hmm. directly it says program completed or something and after that on the portal we can see the collection it should have the two records added to it then right no error displayed here it just says it is completed i'll close this window go back to the portal Mm -hmm. And here we have our collection named as sample. I just expand items over here. And refresh. Do you see that the two records here? Right. I select yeah. one of this. So this is our pickup strawberry is the first one. And this is the second one. Yes. I see there is a spelling mistake here for strawberries. I can no just edit Fine. it over here. I'm just yeah. showing you that edit can happen directly over here as well. Okay. Right. So I just edited that and I can say update directly on portal, or this okay. also can be done programmatically. You can have okay. another procedure for update. We have created yeah. for insert. You can have one for update also. Clear? Okay. Yeah. So you pass one record, two records, 200 records, doesn't matter. This procedure will make sure every mm -hmm. record that you pass to it will be inserted in the collection. Clear? Okay, clear. That's how we work with? Yeah. Procedures. Of procedures. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Now what is the code into the stored procedure that will vary based on your application's requirement? Am I right? Yes, right. Okay. Now let's move on to the last part of this session where we are going to see how do we work with triggers? triggers? Okay. Okay. So once again, I'm using the portal to create the trigger. Mm -hmm. So there are two types of triggers that we can create. One is pre-trigger, one is post-trigger. What is the difference? uh sorry uh post trigger and pre trigger pre trigger in this uh, like uh, nothing but uh, it's already created i think uh, automatically created post i think uh, we are going to create user defined i think uh no both are user defined the thing is trigger is executed based on certain event okay. now in databases how that goes pre executing the query and post executing the query right before yes, insertion right. after insertion before update after update before okay. delete after update after okay. delete Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing over here. Uh, we have pre-trigger and post-trigger, before action and be after action. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. uh, before action is used, when we want to modify the payload, before it is actually inserted, maybe some field is missing we want to add, or maybe some metadata we want to add. Then mm -hmm. post-trigger we use probably where we want to uh, create some logs or we want to uh, trigger another action based on uh, the record creation at one place, right? Mm -hmm. Like cascading entries if we want to do. So in that case, we use the post trigger. Yeah. Okay. 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 So let's go and see the pre-trigger first of all. I just mm -hmm. go to triggers. It's empty as of now. Yes. Right? Not showing anything. <coughs> Here, once again, I use this menu item and I select no trigger. new trigger. Trigger ID, it is asking for our name. This as TRG pre-validate to do item timestamp. What mm -hmm. I want is before the record gets added, added I mm -hmm. want a timestamp field to be explicitly added even if it doesn't contain okay. one in the definition. Okay. Mm. Okay. And then here I need to select what type of trigger it is pre or post. Okay. Post and then trigger operation. I have okay. four options here. Create, delete, replace. 
what does that mean if create. i select create it will run only when the item is added to the collection mm -hmm. not for delete and replace delete will run when the item is removed and replace mm -hmm. will run when item is being modified updated correct right and if i say all that means with whichever action happening this trigger right. will always execute it will applicable all okay so for now i'm going to create it as create trigger operation mm -hmm. is it clear yeah clear whenever the record gets added i want this to be executed and then comes the trigger body mm -hmm. so i delete this trigger body and once again we'll use notepad to create one and i trigger body i will use some pre created code just to save time okay i have a function validate to do item time stamp i said this name and the id need not match it can be different this okay. name anyways is never exposed the right. id gets exposed right correct so you can have different names also just for the example i have used a different name just to prove that okay uh, even different names are fine okay. okay so we have the function we get the context and okay. then we get the request here we can okay. short circuit these two statements directly i could have said where request equals to get context dot get request also okay. if i am nowhere going to use context object anywhere else other than this i can merge these two statements right okay and then here i have item to create object which uh, gets the request body which actually mm -hmm. represents the item that is being added on which the trigger is going to execute so the complete item gets added here uh, into this variable and then we are checking if not time stamp in item to create what that mean item to create object doesn't contain a field called as time stamp okay in that case we generate the time stamp here okay mm -hmm. okay new time stamp and okay. add it to the item to create object mm -hmm. okay if it already contains we just take what user input has given correct right? right and then we say set the body so the incoming mm -hmm. request body has been changed over here to the okay. new one because okay. we have modified it right yeah. and then the actual operation when executes will have time stamp guaranteed even okay. if it is passed or not passed from the client's request clear okay that clear this and go back to portal and paste it here fine let's say save trigger gets created here by yeah. this id yes okay and then it's all about making the call to this trigger okay so this one we will comment and just like before here we'll collapse this and have another helper method created here static async task demo pre trigger async right just for our understanding using simpler names okay should be async right yeah now again there are few things common i need to start with a uh, container id string set mm -hmm. so i say string container id equals to once again we are going to use sample here as that's where we have created the trigger right under sample the trigger is created correct yes right so i put a sample and then i define the container object so here goes container equals to client dot get container yeah what it takes in ids of database and container so db id followed by container id right okay next i need to define 
I just want to know is this cursor triggers and functions are similar to the PLSQL uh, function create triggers? Purpose wise, they are. Okay. Because ultimately, you are playing with the data. So, okay. purpose is same, concept is same. Uh -huh. It's just the structure, how you create them is different over here. Okay, okay. Got it. And uh, yeah, like we will get like um, body, like all those things like uh, in the exactly. PLS, right? Yes. Exactly. So there you write the uh, code using PLSQL language. Here right. we are writing that function in JavaScript. JavaScript. Yeah, got it. That's the only difference. Like yeah. across databases, you have different SQL languages. Right, right. Right. Uh, like PLSQL, there must be something in PostgreSQL also. Right, correct. There will be some similar difference. A similar yeah. uh, things will be there. Yeah, so ultimately the logic that goes inside is doing the similar thing, but because yeah. the language is different, the syntax is slightly different. You are writing code in different, yes. Okay. Yeah. Next. We got the container. We got the container instance created here. Mm -hmm. Next, we have to define the trigger ID. Okay. And what is the ID that we have used for the trigger? I'll just copy from the portal. Okay. Long one, just to avoid the typo. It's better to copy and paste. Okay. okay? That's right. Next, here we go for making the call to container dot scripts. Once again, third time we are using this. Earlier yes. we have used, uh, uh, yeah, in fact, we, uh, not required here uh, as we have already created the trigger on the portal itself. So we can directly move on to the next part where I just create a new item definition. So I say new item of type dynamic. Okay. No. Equals some new item. So here okay. maybe I can. Yeah, dynamic in the sense it is changeable, right? And static uh, in the sense. Yeah, so uh, the data type itself can uh, change, mutate. Can modify, yes. Okay. Okay, so I'll take the new item probably from here. Mm -hmm. One of this I'll copy from the previous uh, demo, right? Okay. So I say new. In fact, they're already in the. Text. So this is what we have, and here I'll change few things. Like, let's say this is again personal. I have category as personal. I have name as groceries once again, and this time the description changes to let's say mangoes. Okay. And is complete as false. This time I'm inserting not from JavaScript uh, or stored procedure. I'm inserting it from my program. So I need to set the ID as well. Okay. One point. So here I say ID is equals to say groceries. But one, some unique value has to go. And it will not be system generated this time. As we have not set the options here, like we did from the procedure. And then we straight away go for await container dot directly. We have a method called as create item async mm -hmm. that allows me to insert a new item. Okay. So here I pass this new item. Okay. Next thing it is asking for the partition key value. I don't want a value for partition key. So I pass null. If I want, I can pass partition key as well. Once again, I can probably say personal is the value. Okay. Let's do that. Mm -hmm. New partition key. And there I'll say the value is personal. And the last part it is asking for is item request options. I'll okay. put it on next line where I say new item request options. Where I need to say which trigger needs to be linked over here. Okay. So I want pre-trigger to be linked. Likewise, you can go for post-trigger as well. 
Okay. If that trigger you want to be, uh, you have configured as post trigger, and you want that to be linked along with this particular insertion, you can say post trigger equals to the okay. name of the trigger. Okay. So here I say new list of type string, and there I pass trigger ID. So if more than one triggers are there, the collection has to be passed here. That's why we have list. Okay. On one same container, I may have more than one triggers also, right? Yes, right. And then here I say await demo mm -hmm. pre trigger async. Fine. Yeah. And let's say control F5. This time also there will be no output on console as such until and unless there is some exception. Okay. Should just say the code is completed without error. Right. Mm -hmm. The result we will see is on portal where portal, yes. if you see here, we have not given any field named as timestamp. Correct. Right. But my record which has been added must have timestamp into it. So I go to okay. items and just say refresh here. Mm -hmm. Third item should be there. Okay. Did you see this id groceries dot one? This is what we have added right now. Okay. If I select this, I have Sorry. a timestamp field here. Do you yeah. Get that? Got it. Mm -hmm. Okay. One more time, I'll execute this. This time, I'll have timestamp field explicitly passed, which represents new timestamp. If I have now, so I'll use time span. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll use it other way. Time span dot. Mm -hmm. Okay, time dot now dot to timestamp directly <clears throat> let's see Let me put two total milliseconds. Okay. Okay. And here I change the ID to groceries two. Here I say this is pick up bananas. Just to make some difference, rest all remains the same. I say control F. This time, what should I see? Instead of system generated timestamp, I should see what I have specified. Correct. Right. Uh, say error. Sure. Now it was working. Now it is conflicting. Strange. Okay. Possibly there is one more namespace which got added automatically. That that is what is making it conflict. So no issues. I just give a alias to this Cosmos namespace. So let's say. Using Cosmos equals to Microsoft dot Azure dot Cosmos, and I can prefix this Cosmos client with Cosmos dot Cosmos client. In thing here. Okay, this is not going to work because again here these methods are coming from the same. Okay. So rather, I just remove the system dot component model, mm -hmm. which is the conflict point, and where we have used component model. In fact, nowhere we are using. Let me build this. 
without component model if it builds we get we are good to go so it it builds okay there are some tools installed on my machine which by default i had some namespace references okay so behind scenes if that happens definitely we have to spend some time okay it worked right yes right okay so let's see on the portal i click refresh once again i have groceries too and here i have time stamp in a different format right number right. of milliseconds is what i have passed and right. that's what it is right right post trigger is very much the same thing it is just that mm -hmm. when it comes to the implementation here first of all you mm -hmm. have to change trigger type to post post then post operations you will write in that function again mm -hmm. trigger operation you have to select whether it is for all or create or delete or replace okay. and then calling remains absolutely same okay just that here while making the call you mm -hmm. have to say whether it's a pre trigger or post trigger for yeah. post trigger you will say post trigger equals to new list oh, got right it. yeah that's how triggers are used yeah okay is it clear yes yes so i hope you like the session today yeah of course of course i like the session today and it's work was really very interesting for me and yes. i will go through the link and all for, for the you know future reference yeah. and and thank yeah. you so much for your time and for this session as well yeah so just yeah, just one more minute i will just share the link for the feedback yeah, one sure. minute will be required to fill the feedback sure definitely so find the link it's be there in my mail somewhere did you receive any mail with the feedback link by the way uh let me Why check or something Uh, you can directly click that link in case if you have no i did not receive any links okay no issues i'll just share that in the chat box okay you can click the link and you can use your mobile phone also to fill up sure definitely i will do that okay so here i got the link and pasted in the chat box yeah um, just... did you get yeah i got it Yes, yes. That's okay. it. Uh, probably by end of the day, you can drop a mail to uh, my colleague Preeti. Sure. Uh, she is the one who sent the invite to you. She okay. will be able to uh, share the recording of this session. I need sure. the link for that. Okay. Sure, definitely. You can you can drop a mail right away also. The point is uh, uh, the processing, downloading, and uploading to YouTube will take some time. So by okay. evening, most likely she will be able to. Right. Yeah, we okay. we have to send drop an email like a session has been completed or something like that. Uh, not required. You just ask for the recording. Sure, definitely. Okay, fine. Sure. Please share the recording for uh, the session title. You can mention there. Okay. And she will share. Yeah. Sure, definitely. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Take care. Bye. Okay.